Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. On this episode of the show, I sat down with my friend Angel Deer. I met Angel about a year ago now when I came to upstate New York with my friend and colleague Marav Artsy. We were running plant dietas here at Angel's um, uh, center, which is called the Sanctuary. It's a shamanic healing center that he founded. So I got to know Angel a bit last year, and then uh, myself and Marav are back this year. So it seemed like a really good opportunity to sit down with him, to have him share. He's a really fascinating guy. Um, originally from Corsica, he was in the corporate world in New York, and then through a, a series of experiences, which he talks about in the podcast, he came to open this really beautiful center called The Sanctuary. Um, so I think you all will really enjoy this episode. Um, as always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Uh, Patreon is a really good option. It's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can sign up. There's a few different tiers you can sign up for, and those different tiers give different things back, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. To all of the people who have supported via that platform, to all the patrons, as always, thank you very much for your support. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, and if you're able to do that, that's a really big help to me to continue to make and produce and edit and, and do all of the things that's required to, to bring out this podcast. I also really like the idea behind it, uh, which is really based on this idea of reciprocity. So if you feel like you're gaining from this uh, podcast to be able to give something back. Um, there's also the ability to direct donate via PayPal. I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. If you're not able to do that, as always, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, leaving any questions or comments in the comments section, that's a really big help with the algorithms to get the show out to a bigger audience. And if you're listening on the audio version, uh, following or subscribing to the show, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, uh, leaving a starred rating and a short review, that's also a really big help. So I think that's it. And without further ado, here's my conversation with Angel. Running up from the maze. Running up from the maze. Running out of the maze. Today. Running up from the maze. Running up from the maze. Running up from the maze. Today. Running up from the maze. Running out from the maze Run out of the maze today Well, cool, man. It's nice to, uh, to finally sit down with you. Yeah, I'm um, glad we did that. You... I guess you had worked with Marav a number of years ago um, mm -hmm. doing a dieta, and then you invited her here, and we ended up coming here and, and running... Um, uh, a retreat on your land, and then we came back this year. Uh, so that's how I, I initially met you. And um, so maybe for the audience, just beginning a little bit of a, a bit of a background of yourself, who you are, where you come from, what what you did in life, and then also what got you interested in this this path you're on, because you've created this this really amazing um, not only home but a, a place for people to come and, and really mm -hmm. learn. Well, I'm originally from Corsica, so it's a French island in the Mediterranean. And I've been here in the US for almost 20 years now, so quite a long time. Uh, I came, I was running companies, uh, working in the corporate world. Uh, came to the US because of that, ended up uh, starting my own business uh, 15 years ago, and then quitting everything and kind of embarking more seriously on this uh, shamanic path, I guess. Um, that's always been here for a very long time, even when I was living abroad or, you know, in UK or other countries I was traveling and living before. And it was kind of always part of my life until the cold was, I guess, stronger and I could not um, accept it anymore, not say no anymore, and I had to really start diving in. And by the time that was happening, I was already, you know, living here, upstate New York, 
couple hours from the, the city. Uh, and I decided to really settle here. I used to live, you know, back and forth between the city and the countryside here, a lot of the mountains. And it became very clear through, you know, my work and what I was doing that I had to really kind of made uh, a clear decision to become a land caretaker, to, to become rooted in one place, understand this land, understand the plants, the trees, the spirits, the history of this place. And um, yeah, I settled there. And then the sanctuary happened right over the years and things developed and you know, that's what they are today. But I don't think I had a clear vision of this, what it's going to be, right? It's going to become this, or I should open a healing center, or I should host people for retreats. Uh, it just came naturally, you know. I met Marav in Peru, like you said, uh, quite many years ago, because uh, I was looking to do a tobacco dieta, and she was recommended by a friend of mine that had said it with her. So I sat with her, but by that time, I was already running retreats in Peru for five or six years, I think. Uh, in the last 15 years, I've been going to Peru three to four months a year, you know, in the last 15 years. Aside from the two years of COVID, I've basically been in Peru every year. I met my teacher there and study there. Uh, so I was going to Peru already a lot before I kind of made the decision to kind of focus on this work. Yeah. What was that like growing up in Corsica? Uh, I grew up on mainland uh, in France, uh, but spent, you know, a um, couple of months a year in Corsica. Uh, for me, it's, uh, you know, it's still home in so many ways, even if I feel really home here in America and I'm American now. But I think there is something about our ancestral land that is um, deeper, more emotional. I still get tears when I arrive there, you know, and I've been going since I'm little. There's something quite um, somatic uh, when I get there. The smell and the land and the trees and the memories and the rocks. Uh, so, yeah, it's a very, you know, traditional island, I guess. People live in villages in the mountain. It's mainly, you know, mountain people, despite it's an island. They are not fishermen, they are shepherds. Uh, historically, you know, it was not very safe to live on the coast because where Corsica is located, there was a lot of invasions and things happening, you know, with the Middle East and Spain and the Greek island and Italy. So the islands had been invaded many, many times. And I think traditionally islanders, you know, felt more safe to live in the mountain. So it's very small communities, uh, people raising cows and sheep. Um, yeah, quite recluded, you know, it's a good climate overall because we're in the Mediterranean, but you know, it's not an easy, you know, it's never easy to live in a mountain, right? It's a bit rough. Uh, but there is a very long also religious and spiritual tradition of healer in that island. Uh, my grandfather was one of them. And so I've kind of been immersed in living kind of close to nature, uh, kind of disconnected from the world a little bit, even if I don't believe that's really our goal, but kind of living, you know, close to a land somewhere, you know, having animals and plants that you know, and rivers and forests, and kind of getting to know your surroundings. And I've tried to escape that uh, for 30 years, I guess, or I don't know if I was trying to escape it, but I never felt the calling as strong as when I embark on this uh, medicine path. And it's funny because the more I was sitting with plants in the Amazon or in Peru and, and the more it was becoming clear that I had to reconnect to my ancestors, to my traditional land. And it's coming strongly to me now, you know, and very clearly it gives me ground, I guess. Uh, yeah, meaning, connection, history. Um, yeah, it's, it's a growing part in me still but I can feel it's something that's going to keep growing uh, for many years to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who, who we're working with, she's also from Corsica. And yes. She was telling me a story 
I think yeah, I could be getting it wrong, but I think she said Napoleon when he would always know when he was near Corsica because there was a smell of a certain mm. plant, and he yes. would know that only in Corsica can you find that. Yes, yes, there is what's called the maquis in Fran in uh, Corsica, which is basically the what you would call the under forest, a lot of, like bushes. Basically, they are very dense in Corsica, and the maquis you can't really enter it, right? You, you would need something to cut it, a little bit like the jungle in many ways. Uh, and in that maquis, there is a few plants that are, you know, very aromatic. I mean, islands, the island smells a lot because there's a lot of aromatic plants. Uh, but one of them is called myrt, and they made some kind of alcohol with it. And there's another one called arbuz, and two or three that are very smelly. And if you come on the island by boat, which you can do from Italy or France, which is what I usually do because I don't like to fly there, I like to come by boat, uh, a good hour before you arrive, so you start just seeing the coast, you start smelling the island, mm -hmm. which is kind of, uh, usually when I get my tears, in fact, I'm just sitting on the deck of the boat and starting smelling and then it just like brings, uh, yeah, a lot of emotion, yeah. You mentioned your, your grandfather was a healer of sorts, so would, can you speak a little bit about what, what kind of work he was doing? Yeah, there's, a, there's an old tradition of uh, what we call guérisseur, so healer, I guess, in, in English, in Corsica, um, that you find also in the south of France and in part of France, people that you would go to if you have any kind of ailments, basically, and they would mainly heal by touch. You know, they would just put their hands on you and just heal. And my grandfather um, always did that, but kind of have a second life, right? Not as his main job. If you met him in his career, you know, he was a philosophy and Greek teacher. He was running uh, schools, high schools. He was principal of schools. Uh, so he had this uh, basically main job. But when he was in Corsica, people would know that he had this power or gift uh, and will come. So I remember growing up, people just showing up because they had this cancer or they had this big disease or they had this problem and him just doing that thing. He would also make those little uh, piece of wood like, like that. And I have one of them that he made for me uh, that he would in bed with prayers and with some signs on it and that he would give people when they leave after the session and ask them to basically hold it and to pray every day with it or to connect with it until the, the healing is completed. Um, so he was known for someone making little wood stick, that's how they call him, the guy that makes the little wood stick. Uh, and he would make, he's made thousands of them and I've crazy stories of healing uh, that I've witnessed uh, just with that because sometimes people could not travel right so he would just make that ship it by mail and people will just uh, you know have that and some of the crazy were sorry were pretty crazy I mean and so I've always been fascinated by him when I was little uh, I always felt somehow that I was going to follow on that kind of path uh, we have a tradition in the family of men on the on that side of the family every two generations there is a healer so his grandfather was a healer and the grandfather grandfather was a healer and my grandfather told me the story i think when i was a young teen they say you know it always jump a generation and it's always a man somehow and my grandfather only had daughter anyway mm -hmm. uh, so my mother and, uh, you know, I have a brother, but I, I kind of knew that if it happened, I mean, not that I was seeking that, but maybe it will be something that one day I would do. Uh, even if I don't do the little piece of wood, uh, I'm, you know, kind of in that lineage. And there is kind of a very old story in the family of where it's coming from thousands of years ago, an old story of that healing gift that was gifted to the family a long, long time ago. Do you know how your grandfather learned that? Was it like something he tapped into or was something that was passed down? He tapped into, yeah, nobody taught him, yeah. He was quite, uh, he never liked to talk about it much, you know. He never took money for his healing. He didn't want anybody to talk too much about it. Uh, he was kind of the, 
thing in the family that nobody talks about, which was quite interesting. Like my mother never mentioned it, right? And it was not something I learned from growing up. Uh, but yeah, he just learned it. He said it's a gift that just appear to people and he said, if it comes, it will come. That's why he said, you know, I won't really teach you. I tried when he was, he passed away four or five years ago and I was trying in the last year, uh, kind of get him to explain me how he does that. And he said, you know, um, it will come, right? If it's you, it will come. And so I believe that specific things will come. In fact, I had visions already about it. I have not really called it in my prayer or focus on that, but I think there is, uh, yeah, there is something that just somehow just show up, I guess. So what was it uh, that first led you away from France? You said you were in the UK first before coming yes, to Yes, it was uh, work. I was working for a um, luxury company, out of our company, for LVMH, for Louis Vuitton. And I was offered to become the CEO of the, another company, Lalique, a cross all company, uh, for UK, so to run the UK uh, entity. And so I moved to UK. Uh, I was like 30 years old, so I was pretty young. And I uh, ran the corporation there for two years. And then after two years, they asked me to move to the US uh, to run US and Canada. And so I moved when I was 32 years old, uh, so now I'm 49, uh, to New York to run that company. I mean, it was a really big job. I was really young at the time. Uh, you know, it was, it was great, but definitely felt very far from what makes me feel alive. That was my main problem. I never felt really fulfilled by any of that corporate work. And what was it that, that eventually, like in a way, led you out of that? I guess it was the, I mean, there was a couple of very specific events that I felt very guided, I guess, in some sense. But um, when I left everything, I was running my own business. So I started a startup company with a friend of mine, uh, Christophe, um, an online e-commerce company. And we just started together in our apartment in New York. And within three years, we had 200 employees. We had raised uh, $50 million. So we were successful, right, in the definition of success in the corporate world. And we were, you know, quite famous and we were doing interviews on TV and all that. And so we were kind of the, the peak of that experience. And um, in that year, we got nominated, I got nominated with Christophe as the entrepreneur of the year in the US, which is like this big deal award. Uh, and there was this ceremony in New York in Times Square to receive the award for the nomination. And I was at that ceremony uh, and I was really feeling not well at all. Like I felt almost like a fraud, like I should not be there, like it was not me. I mean, there was this kind of almost splitting inside of me. Like obviously, yes, I did that and all of that, but the, there was a part of me behind it that was like, this is just a mask. This is a facade. Like uh, you're on stage right now wearing a mask and wearing this costume, you know, you're playing a role, but this is not who you are. That's what I felt as I was about to come on stage. And there was a few thousand CEOs and, you know, the mayor of the city of New York City and, and all of that. And I came on stage to receive the award and, you know, got it. And I had to make a speech for a few minutes, which I did, which was so painful because I just could not feel any authenticity because I know I had to encourage people and say how happy I was, but I was not happy. I mean, I was blessed, you know, and grateful for receiving that, but I was not happy and I felt like I was leading people to believe in a fake dreams that everybody here in the room wanted that award right next year or another time. And it felt very, uh, unreal and I had to leave the stage at some point I just shortened my speech just went out and I just collapsed backstage in this trance I guess you know it was this it's like I was taken over by something really powerful and I know it might sound a little bit crazy or 
but it felt like my brain was purging like all these ideas that I had about myself and the 25 years of corporate world was just like being purged out of me and basically I mean I recovered after that you know I went home and I had dinner with my team and but I got really puzzled by what happened that day and a few weeks later, I went, the, I went to the office one morning. It was a Wednesday morning. I remember very clearly that day. And I sat at my desk and I'm like, I'm done. 20 years done. All this is done. I need to quit. And, you know, I let, you know, a lot of investors and, you know, a lot of responsibility, hundreds of employees and, you know, and I told them I need to go. I need to go. I can't stay. And nobody really understood why, because they were asking me why. And, I, you know, I, I, I just said, this is not me. This is not what I want to do. And they could not understand that I spent, you know, four years of my life building such a big business and being at this kind of amazing place with it and wanted to go. And it took a few weeks or I think a month to kind of get things, you know, settled and find a new CEO to replace me and... You know, they asked me to stay on the board and I was like, okay, I'll stay on the board. And I basically left, left and I took a one way. I sold everything I had. I, you know, I just kept one backpack basically. So put my whole life in it and I took a one way ticket to India. Yeah, I felt like I just had to run away. I just could not. It was very confused at the time in the sense that Sometimes you hear people, they quit because they, they have a very clear vision. I had no clear vision of what was next. I just knew that where I was, was not me. So I had to depart, you know, and what it, it was very scary, by the way. It's not like, I don't know, because living that way, I didn't get any money, right? It's not like I left with millions of dollars. I left with nothing, you know, and I was very okay with it. I was like, I don't want anything, right? But I just not knew I had to go. I just had to go. And the furthest I could think was India. And the most different I could think was to go uh, volunteering, doing something that was not about me, because I felt the last 20 years was a lot about me. You know, my money, my ego, my career. And so I flew to Calcutta and I went to Mother Teresa and I just banged at the door and I asked if I could help. And they say, come in. And that's how, uh, yeah, it started kind of. That was in many ways the beginning of the channeling. Like a lot of things open when I was walking at Mother Teresa. Uh, I walked in the home for the dying people, which is uh, the first place she opened. Uh, she's basically, you know, you, you go in the streets and you pick up people that are dying that have probably left, lived their whole life in the streets. And, you know, poverty in Kolkata is not like poverty in New York or in the Western world. We're talking about millions of people in the streets, including babies and little children. And yeah, and we would take those men. There was a female side and the male side, so I was in charge of the male. And so we took those old men that had, you know, uh, just dying in the street and bring them in, put them in the bed, wash them, shower them, give them comfort uh, so they don't die alone. And for most of those men, it was the first time they had a physical contact or human care or some kind of kindness or gift. And so I spent months there just uh, in the... When I say hospital, you know, imagine an old abandoned church with, you know, army bed on the floor, right? Hundreds of them. So pretty intense, you know, setting. Uh, by taking care of men with, you know, tuberculosis or just dying of old age. And, um, and he was, um, yeah, I felt like I was, I guess, looking back, it was like a ceremony. You know, if anyone does a plant medicine ceremony, there's this moment where you're just in that space of spirit, of creator, of love, vibration, those moments of just immense clarity where you just arrived. And it felt like that. It felt like that. It was, uh, 
and I started having a lot of um, like I, I felt like I was on psychedelics I felt like my brain was just so open I was just hearing like 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 void like when you talk to me right now like in normal consciousness I was hearing very clear instructions you know about my life and what I had to do to heal what I had to do to to really it was not just like they're like don't you could move on this other planet you're not going to heal there's things that you need to move from inside and so I started to really pay attention to that um, yeah and I had a very I guess probably the most mystical experience of my life was there when I was there one day yeah even more profound than any ceremony I've ever done you know and uh, yeah, without anything, right? Just uh, being present. Do you think part of that is, uh, like in yoga terms, they, there's many paths of yoga, and one of those is karma yoga, like mm. this idea of not only service, but, but moving outside of, as you said, like everything's about me, towards mm. there's, I, there's things outside of me. Yeah. And also, like even this idea of like bhakti yoga, like the yoga of devotion, mm. you know, there's something about, I would imagine there's a very devotional quality about that. That's Yeah, it's different. very true what you think. It's very, very true. In fact, a couple of months before all of that happened, I went to, uh, I was very interested in, interested in the Shambhala uh, lineage of monks and Buddhism, the Shambhala lineage specifically, and crazy wisdom. And I was reading a lot about it and studying, and, and I met um, the man that runs the Shambhala Center here on the East Coast. And I was not well at the time. You know, I knew I was not well. I knew that I had to do something because if not, I was going to die. Basically, just so I felt I would become like empty completely. And he told me I was asking him about ashram in India and place I could go to find myself. And he, he's the one who told me, say, don't. To heal yourself, you need to do something that's not about you. He said, if not, you're going to just spin with your problems and your head in an ashram, right? In a retreat, you're just going to think of it. He said, go do something that has nothing to do with you. Go serve. And he said, you can go anywhere for that. And he said, once something shift, once something happened, then call me and I'll tell you which ashram to go. And that was, you know, it was one of the key, you know, sometimes you have a key mess, little message like that are really key on your path. And I felt it was like the best advice I ever received. Because I think if I went to India to just travel or, you know, just do a yoga retreat or meditation, I don't think for me it would have worked. I think there was so much mind that, and he told me, he said, you have too much mind, you need to crack your heart open. It's, you can't do anything with your mind anymore. It's just too much. Don't put more teachings in it. Don't try to understand more. We need to crack your heart. And they say, if you serve. And then when I thought of it, I was like, well, what can I serve in a way that's going to be really like full on, right? Uh, and I was like, oh, Mother Teresa, right? And I heard the story of Mother Teresa and the home for the dying a year before. And I was like, this is where I want to go. I want to hold people's hands when they're dying. I want to give them touch when they never had touch, you know, kind of brush their hair and, I mean, you wipe their ass, you give them bath, right? It's, uh, there's no glory in it. It's not about you at all. Um, and at the same time, it's, you, I mean, I don't know the intensity of the connection with those men. I mean, I still remember them. I still remember them 10, 15 years later. Mm. Do you think that's something that's been a bit lost in maybe this more modern spiritual resurgence? Because it often is, as you put it, it's very much about me, like my enlightenment, my journey, my my truth, my... Yeah. <laughs> and um, I mean, even in the, the, you know, what we would consider like the the major Western religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, that act of service is a fundamental part of those religions, and it seems like it's something that's been very much forgotten. Um, that act of, of penance, of service, of, of 
even giving, not only financially, but I mean, you see that in all those religions, but, but an act of service, of coming together and working for something that's not of the self. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously our society is very self-centric, right? And uh, egocentric, but even more than just ego, just self-centered. Uh, but in a way that is uh, not in service most of the time of the collective. And we have forgotten that we are in relations, you know, like here it's not just me that you're talking. You're talking to my parents, my grandparents, my friends, my all my relations are in my voice and, you know, Either you influence me, either what I receive, that's going to reverberate, right, in the whole web of connection. Last night I was listening to an elder from Hawaii, and she's a woman, an elder, and she was saying that there is no self-care if there is no community care. They say, we are very self-centered, and we focus a lot on our healing. They say, it's not our healing, it's a healing of our community. We need to think of it that way. And if we just self-center it, we are not going to heal because we can't heal outside of the system because we are in the system. Either we like it or not, either we agree with the system or not, we are in it, right? So it's a very Western colonial kind of way to see that, oh, I can't do all what I want, right? I have this freedom, but she said, yeah, but your freedom comes with responsibilities. That's how native people see it, right? I just don't do things in my community, in my tribe, if it's going to hurt anyone, right? It's it's not just me, I'm responsible for the group. And I think we don't heal alone, we heal alone together. We, there's something to be said about the collective body also, you know. And I've experienced that so much as I deepen my path that when I do work on people, I feel them inside of me. I know where to extract, in fact, through my body. And I don't really know where their body and my body is at some point. And then I can expand that to the body of the earth, right? To the body of all my relation, the animals and the plants and the trees and the ancestors. And um, yeah, and I think the very often people get really stuck in their healing because they're very obsessed, you know, with their own pain, which, you know, sometimes our own pain is obsessive, right? It's hard to get out of it. But sometimes to kind of turn towards something else, which might be service and giving, right, without, you get nothing in return, right? I, and at some time you're gonna get everything. I didn't go to India, um, to Mother Teresa, like, oh, I'm gonna get this back. No, I was just going, I just need to stop doing what I'm doing, and I need to stop thinking, and I'm just going to use my hands for something else, right? And I was thinking, well, I'm gonna do that for a few months, and if something shifts, I'll go do my ashram, my, my retreats, but in fact, I got the biggest gift without going for it, right? I received, I didn't take a gift, right? I gave and I received, which is very how native people think of receiving, right? You go in the forest and, and you put an offering, you put tobacco to a plant before picking the plant, right? So you, you, you say thank you before you receive, right? And it's given to you, it's, you don't take it already. So it's a, it's a whole different way to look at our healing, I think, which brings, yeah, the concept of, I guess, grace, right? This mysterious thing that heals us, that even if we have all the tools and all the knowledge, it might never happen, right? We can drink in hundred ceremonies. There's a moment of deeper surrender where we say, I'm nothing right, takes me or, you know, and something bigger comes, right, and we can't really name it, call it that well, right, it's, it's hard to grasp when those things happen, but they're so clear, they really are very clear and powerful, and very often, yes, in those acts of selfless giving, which is the way, you know, that's what the earth does, right, you can go now outside and cut 20 trees and kill animals and burn the land, she's still going to give you food, water, beauty with the sunrise. So she's still going to be this amazing mother or grandmother, like with just love you unconditionally, even if you are broken, even if, even if you lost your prayer, right? She doesn't care. She's going to feed you like the other kids that pray every day, 
you know. And I think that's, if we think we are part of this body, then the return to our, you know, health, to our balance, is to try to become that, to, or to remember that, because that's what we are. So just to let it, you know, pierce through us. And that's very difficult, I think, in the Western world. And very often, I think it's missing a lot in the spiritual community or movement, whatever that means, you know. Um, Do you think there's something also about, you mentioned, like you were in such a dark place that you knew you needed to shift something quite dramatically. Mm. And, uh, you know, you said something very interesting is, I went to uh, Kolkata, which is poverty. You know, there's, there's poverty there. Mm. And it's a different poverty than you were used to. Mm. And something about that perspective can also maybe in a way shake us out of something because we realize, you know, or, or working with all of these sick people, we realize like, I'm sick, but there's also another type of sickness. There's, there's I don't have any money, but there's a poverty that's much different than that as well. Mm which also seems to cultivate this idea of, of gratitude in a way. Even when we're in a really dark place, it's like, wow, like there's people worse off than me. And that kind of, there's a healing in that. There's a, life isn't so, like my problems aren't so grave. They're not so dense when before that's all we can see because that's... Yeah, it's a, it's such a, a good point and a tricky point at the same time, I always feel because... We can't really say that to someone that is in suffering, right? Look at the world and you still have a body and you still have a roof and food and you're okay, right? Because it's not compassionate and, you know, we, we don't experience the pain as someone else, you know, everybody experience their own pain. But I think when it's self-revealed, when we can reconnect to that and, and have an experience of it, then we can remember that prayer of gratitude, right? These just the thank you prayer. In the Indian cosmology, what I've been studying for 15 years, you know, the first prayer is thank you. And they say there's only one prayer. In fact, that's this one. Nothing else matters. And it's a prayer you make when you open your eyes in the morning because you're alive, because you've been given one more day. And believe it or not, it's a gift. You don't know if you're going to open them tomorrow, right? We don't know. Well, we, we think we do, but we don't really. And so this return to that first prayer, yeah, but I don't know if by praying, just praying, I'm going to get it, right? But by, yeah, just sometime an experience outside of you is going to reflect that. And I had many ex instances like that when I arrived in India, in Kolkata. I also work in the slums with children in the children's school. And the slums of Kolkata, I think, is one of the largest in the world, right? It's, well, imagine just a garbage, basically, hill. Huge. And I think there's, you know, over 10 million people living there, you know, twice the population of New York City, uh, just in the slum part. But when I was there, what surprised me the most was the joy of the children. You had children that were, you know, living, it's very dark there, it's a lot of garbage and, you know, it's smelly and there's nothing that we're talking about poverty to a scale that is, you know, really people, uh, the quest of the day is to find food, right? For, for just for the day, right? That's all what we do and, and to, but still you see smiles and light in eyes and kids playing and laughing and at the school, I mean, those kids were like the most happy kids I've ever seen. And you could say, well, they don't know, right? They don't know what they could get, or they don't know that they are poor, probably. Maybe some of them. Um, and it's not like, you know, I say, well, we should live that way, and it's good for them to be that way. But I think very often in, and I explained that in Nepal too, when I was in Nepal in the mountain, I lived there for a while in small villages where people don't have much, right? They have a couple of chickens, maybe one cow, if there are farmers, you know, and they have very, very little but there is this depth of gratitude that is just shining through them. And that reflects back at me, right? I was like, oh, I'm coming to New York and I'm unhappy. And it's like, so it kind of shuffles all your priority, right? Your, your to-do list, what you look at, what's your problem, what you have, what you don't have, you kind of shuffled it completely. 
one day I was, um, I think it was just arrived, it was like four or five days and I had a day off uh, from helping at Mother Teresa and I was just sitting in the street, on the side of the street, just with my camera, just looking and, you know, at the animals and just taking photos and, and there was this man that was sitting next to me who was a beggar. He had this little short, he was, you know, during the monsoon season, it was very hot. I think it was in July. And he has his shirts with a few holes in it. And then he had two wood stick, I remember, and a kind of a little tarp above his head to protect him from the sun. And he was just looking and he had this big smile with almost no teeth left. Just like he had this, like, he was like a little Buddha, just like such a powerful presence. And I just looked at him. And I got really, I don't know, I got mesmerized by it. And he looked at me and he spoke to me in English. Usually old people speak English in India. And he said, why are you not happy? He told that to me. And I got, it's like an arrow was like literally threw into my heart. And I was like, and you know, I had my camera, like I was well dressed, you know. So I was like, that's what he sees, right? That's what he tells me. I was like, no, I'm happy. And, and he's like, no, you're not smiling. I'm smiling. And so I, I kind of paused at that moment and I knew he was right. <laughs> there was no, he saw that I was not happy despite I was smiling, right? And I told him, I said, why are you happy? And he looked at me and he opened his eyes, he said, sun in the sky, food in my belly, clothed, happy. This man that had nothing. Like, you know, I don't even know if he was eating every day or... But he was. That's the trick. He was not playing a game with me. He was not pretending anything. He was so direct. And I got, I just broke in tears, like my own grief, my own, you know, <laughs> insanity. He was seeing things more clearly than I did, right? That was such a big lesson. You know, it was this moment of like, and it shuffled me a lot because then I was like, but what am I looking for? Then what do I need? Because I like, I got even more lost. I, go, I have all of this and, but I don't feel like him. I have more, right? But I don't feel like that. And how do we, how do I find this? How do I really experience it like here? Like, not playing a game, right? I am happy, I'm good. Like, every cell of his body. And um, I guess that's the quest, right? How do we really experience it to that depth? There's an interesting, I think he was a medical doctor. His name is uh, Larry Dosey, and he did a lot of research on prayer, which was quite interesting because he, he kind of thought it was nonsensical. There obviously can't be any truth to that. But somehow he started studying it. I, I don't know if he was working with people in their deathbed and he maybe saw there was, there was some benefit of people who were praying, but he, he started, um, he started doing some research, and it was a long time ago. He, he, he wrote a book about it, and I forget the exact details. But essentially, he came to the conclusion that, that prayer worked. But that the prayer that worked was just as you said. It was the prayer of gratitude. Mm. That this prayer, through his scientific analysis, actually had an effect. And it's, um, as you said, it's something you find in cultures all over the world, is this idea of gratitude, mm. like waking up in the morning. I mentioned this a few times in my podcast, but my, my grandmother, who's 95 now, uh, one day she was talking to me, and uh, her, her, my grandfather, her husband, had died recently, and she, she was saying when she wakes up in the morning, the, the way she stays happy and positive is like she's opening her eyes and she looks around the room, and she said, you just need to find one thing, one thing that you're grateful for and focus on that. Mm. And I was like, wow. Yeah, the elders, they know, right? 
I mean, this Andean cosmology prayer and you open ceremony with that thank you to the east, to the fire, right? The sunrise, the first light in the morning. It's really, the prayer is beautiful and longer than just thank you, but really in its essence, it's, it's gratitude. It's just a thank you prayer. And sometimes I often feel like, oh, I can feel like, okay, I can do that, right? It's very much in the head, right? How do I really feel it? And I feel, you know, if they've been doing that, you know, that prayer is probably 10,000 year old, we don't know, maybe older. It's the finest technology, right? It's been evolving and they, they kept that prayer that way and somehow they, they say that's the technology to be happy, right? That's uh, medicine to be happy. Um, it looks too simple to be that complex. And yes, I think that's what it is. Sometimes, you know, those uh, mystic uh, religions like the Sufis or others, it looks like, you know, oh, it's very simple. It's about love, it's about relationship with God, or it's about gratitude. But I think we sometimes we don't see how much, how power, much power there is. And very often I think it's hidden in those prayers. You know, it's, so, it's, it's made simple so we might overlook it. We don't understand how much power because he was made very complex and symbols and words and well, like, you know, oh, there must be something there. But I think there's such a profound teaching that God or the creator or those elders or those tradition are showing us, right? It's, it's, that is quite simple. And if you return to that simplicity, you know, with a lot of humility and uh, yeah, a lot of attention, a lot of presence, you can find that thing you're looking for, that transformation. You know, you, you, we have this power, right? Because we an extension, like, you know, of God. You know, there's this, like, symbol. Uh, I can't remember which civilization in Peru it's coming from, but it's a little hand in clay. It's literally just the wrist and the hand. And that symbol represents that you can sit in the hand of God, right? You need to learn to really sit in it. So it's this, you know, I guess it's faith, right? It's surrender. It's really finding a set, really not fighting and just really softening, right? Not, you don't have to do it yourself. You can soften in the hand of God. And they say that the symbol is also that you become the hand of God if you do that. That it's a double hand. It's your hand and it's the hand of God. But first, you need to kind of surrender, right? Because if not, it's power, right? It's ego. It's I know, you don't know, I have access to it, you know. No, it's first, it's like letting that surrendering happen. I love that little symbol. To me, it's always a good remembering of how do I do that, right? How do I really sit? How do I soften? How do I trust, right? And feel, not think. <laughs> Uh, so I can get be like that man in India, right? Just like, phew. he was sitting in his throne and he was a beggar. And there's many Indian story about that, right? That the beggar on the side of the road might be, you know, one of the God in disguise, which felt very much to me. That's what we was that day. And it's God really laughing at us, right? Look, it's right there, right? So simple. And you're looking all over find it hmm. but yeah prayer works mm. that's for sure so what was the the next step on your journey you you, you spent this time in uh, with mother Teresa you went to an ashram after that or no I spent uh, I went to all the holy sites in India from Rajasthan to, you know, um, went to see the Dalai Lama, I went to, uh, uh, yeah, different place where the Buddha was enlightened. So I was doing basically uh, a couple of weeks of travel and sitting or staying at sacred sites. And then two, three weeks of volunteering again in different, not just Mother Teresa, other place. And I did that in India and then Sri Lanka and then Nepal and the Philippines. So I spent a year basically uh, just doing that until I felt, okay, I know you go home or you don't, but at some point, you know, it was time to come back to America. Uh, still had no idea what I was going to do, but I was happy. I, I, I kind of the, 
it was like I knew there was something else, but I, did, I knew I didn't have to search for it. I just had to show up for myself to keep doing my healing work, to keep, you know, um, going to Peru and study with the people I study with. And really, yeah, there, I think there was a clear moment where I just release uh, expectation on myself, on what my past should look like, where it should go, how should I make money, you know, like all the fears of what might happen. And, you know, and it was like a year abroad, so it was starting to feel like, okay, I need to make some money at some point if I want to live in America. But I guess I was just trust. It felt very much to me like I always believe in some kind of creation God or like a power that way, like something that's infused in everything. But I think it was very mental. And I felt like that time helped me, it just dropped in my heart. My faith was more not just intellectual, I had this belief and maybe some experience of it, but it felt in my heart and belly. It felt like I could, yeah, it was there, right? It was knowing and I didn't need proof anymore. I didn't really need to search anymore because it didn't really matter somehow, you know. It felt very freeing in many ways. Do you think there's something about that experience that's conducive to that? Because uh, I also traveled for two years, and I, I never expected it to be two years. I thought it would be a month, maybe five weeks, I, I don't know, until the money ran out, because I left with very little. But it turned into two years, and, and I think a big part of that is what you said. There was, there's something that begins to happen experientially when you learn to trust. Mm -hmm. Like this was before Airbnb or <laughs> maps on your phone. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> and it's just showing up somewhere, taking the local bus. Yeah. Is there somewhere to stay? I hope so. I'll ask around. Yeah. You know, is there food? And maybe there's not. Maybe that means sleeping mm. on the street. Maybe that means wandering into the forest and putting putting out a sleeping bag. But but somehow I found after a while it never became, it wasn't, there was never a problem. It was just, I deeply felt I'm always going to be okay. It's Yeah. I think in many ways, I would often feel like safety and comfort is the death of evolution. Like if you see how nature evolves, it's because there is pressure, right? Pressure from, I don't know, Bedor wants to eat that plant or the weather, the winds are getting stronger or it's getting drier. So that pressure, you know, external pressure, uh, there's not a reaction of anger in nature, right? Or of things like that. Even when an animal attacks another animal, it's not through anger, right? It's just to feed itself. So it's kind of very aligned, right? It's like in interdependence. Those genes, right, get activated, right? Our epigenetics get activated and we access things that in comfort, we don't have to access, right? I don't have to listen to the voice of the forest to find my food. I don't have to really pay attention to the weather if I have a roof. Uh, but when we reconnect to nature, when we reconnect right to that, we, we start to be much more attuned, right? And I think we have immense resources inside of us. There's this awaken. And one of them is the one you mentioned that we know that resilience because we have traveled the world. In our ancestors, we have people that have migrated, we have people that, so we are, we know that we have capacity to do that, you know, but we are afraid we don't because we've never experienced it. It's like I say, oh, you can play the violin. Here's a violin, you'll be like, I've never played it, right? It might be difficult. But for what relates to life, being happy and all of that, we, it's embedded, right? It's in the encoding of it. This harmonious balance we see in the forest around us, it's embedded in us too. But somehow, you know, we, we're afraid it's not there, right? That we have to somehow find it somewhere else, like that it's going to be, and sometimes it's very difficult to access, that's true. But I feel, yeah, it, it gets revealed to us. And then we look back and then, yeah, the next challenge is easier, right? Because we're like, okay, you know, something is going to, we, we get to trust more, right? And we get to surrender more, right? To soften, right? Life is not, doesn't have to be a constant fight and, you know, and 
And then I think that's when we can return, right? Because then we have something to offer that is of value in this world. You know, I think that's the gift, right? It's, it's, we're not receiving it for us, we're receiving it for our relations. You know, the tree that's stronger in the forest, he feeds the other trees, you know, he uses his big canopy, not just for himself. So nature is designed that whatever I receive, right, I'm going to have to give it, right, somehow. Because anyway, I'm going with nothing. So I think that's the calling after too. For me, that was becoming clear that kind of hearing those voices, okay, what are you going to do about it now? Or like one of my favorite pastor here in town always tell me, he says, so what is God asking of you? What do you think God is asking of you, right? I'm not giving you an answer, but you have to ask yourself, what is asked of me in this moment, in this time we are living in, right? with COVID, with pandemics, with wars, with, you know, all the social inequality. And then I think we all have to you know, kind of feel, okay, what is asked of me? Not as a savior, not as God, not as a Messiah, but me with my little skill, with my knowledge. Okay, where, where am I going to plug onto that whole system? What do I want to do with this knowledge, with this softening, with that wisdom, you know? How can it serve? You know, self-care, community care, same thing. So, how, how does it serve the community? You know, not that it's always clear how to do it, right? But it's where we need to point the prayer, right? It's never, you know, in the end cosmology, the first two prayers are in words, but the next two and the end prayers are outwards. You know, so the first is inside, and but then you go out. So, it's also how the altar is pointed, right? It points out, it points to service. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think a lot of people also are unhappy and not healing because it's missing that component very often, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, we just keep going to retreat or keep doing it. it's, And I always tell people, just find something that is really not about you. Something to give, you know, the local, you know, shelter there for homeless whatever it is something like help your local church you know whatever you believe in whatever feels right but something where you don't get anything out of it you're not gonna get money you're not gonna get recognition it's for others it could be animals it can be whatever it is doesn't matter but make sure it's not about you because I feel the fire if not it's like stuck right it's like we're recycling our fire and the fire he wants to whew, light the world right so we need to expand it. And very often that enough to kind of soften people, connect to other things, get us out of our head, right? Feel better about ourselves. You always feel good when we help someone, you know? We're wired for it, you know? Reminds me, I, I had a yoga teacher who I really liked and uh, there was a number of people there who had been there for multiple retreats. I, I won't name the teacher, <laughs> but um, but I think they were asking him the same questions, and um, and finally he just looked at him and he said, "You just need to get a job. <laughs> 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 like enough of this. Like <laughs> yeah, you just need to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not just what it needs. Like our responsibility. Sometimes we need to kind of step in." And it's a good point you're making because I think, you know, because we don't have right of passages, we don't have initiations in our culture. Very often, you know, we are in an adult body, but very often people are children or young teen, right? The emotional part of the body, the, the part that is a caretaker, like the father or the mother, you know, has no, not been born yet, right? Because there hasn't been a rite of passage or maybe there is no child or there is no things that traditionally would have been there, right? If you live in a tribe or in a community, you would have been in service since young age, right? And you would have had a rite of passages, you know, to recognize that you're not a child anymore, you're becoming an adult. And very often, yeah, that's like getting a job, right? Paying your taxes, or you like it or not, you know, doing things that are like maybe but then you take responsibility for your life, right? If not, you're just floating around and going to this retreat or traveling, you know? But it's like a teenager, right? What people will do 
after graduating from university for a year, right? But then at some point you come back and you work, right? You do something. And I feel we have a lot of adults um, that haven't transitioned yet because life had allowed them to, you know, kind of leave maybe that lifestyle or that. But for whatever the reason, I think the suffering people experience is also because there is this disconnect between the adult body, the soul on that's waiting to do something, right, for this world that is waiting to be on purpose, and the emotional body that is still young, that is still traumatized or afraid or that hasn't healed properly, that hasn't evolved. So it's like the internal alchemy is uh, fragmented in some ways, right? Which in shamanic term is very real, right? You have those parts that you have abandoned from your childhood or traumas and you kind of need to retrieve them, right? You, you don't kill them, <laughs> you bring them back in so you can grow all of that together. It's missing a lot in our world. Um, and I think the more privileged you are, the more it's going to be missing because you don't have to show up, right? If you don't have privilege, then you probably have to work when you were 16 years old. And if you're a young mom and you're 20 years old and you need to go to work and feed your kids, I mean, you have to step in, right? That's your rite of passage, right? Even if it's horrible in some ways, but you somehow have to do it, right, to survive. But many people don't have to do that to survive. And I think very often we can get just stuck into that quest of like yeah finding the answer right i always tell people i never found the answer right or an answer in fact <laughs> it's still a quest right it's more a state it's more a feeling but it's not a, a word it's like i want to feel like that man right whatever i'm doing you know even when i find my text can i just experience that can i just feel okay you know this is this is where I am in this world. This is what I'm part of. And, you know, I'm still pointing my prayer where I want to go, right? But I think it's difficult in today's world because, you know, we don't have elders and we don't have the structure culturally to foster, to grow adults. So it's kind of normal that we feel lost, that we consume so much antidepressants and alcohol and that there is so much addictions and depression i mean it's not surprising right because we're not designed to live that way i don't believe we are mm. have you ever thought about why these initiation rites began to be lost i mean i even remember when i was younger i, I was a boy scout and I, I got my Eagle Scout, which is kind of the, the highest rank. I, I got it relatively young. I was 16. And then I did this thing called the Order of Light. And, and I was thinking about it the other day. And it, you know, it seems like a long time ago. So also I question, like, do I even remember it correctly? Um, but I remember it very clearly where I was just dropped off in the middle of the woods with a knife. And either I had to go somewhere and meet after three days, like find my way through the woods, find shelter, find food, you know, water, uh, or, or they pick me up at a, a certain point. I, I can't remember, but um, but I remember at that time it was just very normal because also in a way I'd been building to that. Like through the scouts, I was camping every weekend. I I knew how to start fire. I knew how to shoot a bow and arrow. I knew how to shoot a gun. I knew how to kill an animal. I knew. Uh, how to fix things. Uh, you know, mm. I think part of that was also my family, my grandfather kind of came from that generation of you just fix everything. So I grew up, if something was broken, you fixed it. You didn't, mm -hmm. you didn't throw away anything. Um, but I, I was just talking to that uh, about that to someone the other day and she was joking, but it's probably true that that would be considered child abuse these days to, to drop someone off at 16 <laughs> yes. in the middle of the woods with a knife and just leave them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I think we're overprotecting, you know, children today in many ways. And because we think we're fragile, right? The system is designed. I really believe that the corporate system in general, the systemic ways our countries are built is very much about separating us from each other. You know, it's designed and to do that, I need to break 
your belief, right? I need to break your rite of passages, your languages, your traditions, your connection to ancestors, you know, and I don't believe there's an evil forcing regulating that, but I think there's a part of the human psyche that is violent, that is, you know, kind of scared and afraid and there's a tendency to kind of do those things, right? And when it comes in the hands of people that have power through politics or money or other ways, the impact can be broaden because for that system to work you don't want people that be really empowered and strong voices if you have people that believe they can change the world then gather other people to change the world that's a problem right for any organized system in our culture because if you look at native americans or other people it's very much that kind of democracy right it's the voice of all you know and you're not the chief because you have the most money all the most power, you're the chief because you're recognized by the whole group as the voice of wisdom. And the voice of wisdom is very different than the voice of power or the voice of money as the way it is in our society. So if you put power and money and you know other interests that have nothing to do with wisdom, with health and wellness of the community, not just how much the GDP is growing, but how much happiness is growing. Uh, well, then you get to what it looks like today. You know, there is, I think there is no surprise. And I think anything that's in the way of that system, then it's a witch hunt, right? It's like we can't really allow that because it doesn't fit in the system. And if you look at the school system, it's a bit like that. Right? Kids have to enter a mold that they have to learn this and this and this and that but they're not learning what you learn at boys school. You know, most kids today, they don't even know when they get this square fish fried pan in the pan, what a fish look like. There was a study done in France. I'm talking about 20 years ago. You know, they were, I don't know if they said it in America, but it was square fish. I mean, piece of white fish that is basically fried that you can buy, freezed. And they asked kids in school to draw the fish, to draw fish. And many kids will draw a fish that is a square. You know, and it was, you know, beginning of television is 25, 30 years ago. So, but still, like, that's what they thought a fish was, right? So we're not giving people tools to really understand the world, to live, you know, because then what, guess what? You can reclaim your health. You can reclaim your pharmacy from the forest. You can reclaim decision process right as a community like you can do much more if there is not those agendas that are very different than the interest of the people and i think sadly that you know what happened over the years right we kind of erased that and you know still continuing with native people um, you know in hawaii this elder i was looking to is still happening now right they were not allowed to sing their songs for so long their lands were taken but you see, what was taken from them was more than the tradition in that. What was taken from them was their connection between each other. By isolating them from their lands, from their traditions, from their remedies and their plants, they separated them from each other. And now they might be native, but they might be supporting the army, or they might be supporting the gas industry, and they might be having jobs in these things. So now they are, you know, colonized. You know, and they have to remember who they are and come back together. And that's a difficult process when people have such different point of view, she was saying, right? How do I come back with my brother that is supporting the army when the army for us has been the oppressive power on our island and destroyed us, you know, killed 90% of our people. But I still need to reconnect with my brother, right? That's my goal, you know, we're one. So how do I do that? So we need to remember those rite of passage. We need to bring them back, right? We need to help people to find their inner power, you know, recover that inner power, that clarity of mind, you know, make sense of the world so people don't fall off you know, into crazy ideas and then get so obsessive and even more fearful. You know, there's a lot of that today. People are so afraid that the world is just very dark, right? And yeah, I mean, if you look someplace, it is dark, but there's also beauty, right? And there's people that believe in that. There's people that cultivate that. So it's not all doom and gloom. 
Um, but many people are saying, yeah, I've lost hope. I mean, that's why people take drugs, right? And so much addiction and depression and suicide. And it's because people don't feel hope and there is no connection anymore, right? There's nobody can help. I'm alone, right? I'm really alone in this. That's the worst disease of this culture and to have isolated us from each other. At the end of the day, I think that's the most, most scary than any war that's been run in the world today. It's this constant war between each other. Yeah. You seem to be, I mean, speaking about connection and initiation, uh, one of the interesting things you seem to be doing is, is like working with children, bringing them to the land. Mm. I think you, you call it like the forest school uh, and teaching them about nature, which much like, as you said, uh, uh, with the fish, I, I remember reading a similar thing. I mean, who knows what's true and what's not, but, but they, they asked American children, where does an apple grow from? Mm. And the answer was a tree, the supermarket, or I don't know, something else. And the, the most commonly picked answer was not a tree mm -hmm. because they had never seen just, one. Yeah, they had never seen it. And, yeah. you know, I mean, e even, even the work that, that we're doing a lot of work with tobacco and I would say the vast majority of people don't realize that tobacco is a plant, mm. that it's a green plant that has flowers. <laughs> most people that's kind of a shock when they hear it. They, they understand it once they hear it, but mm. they wouldn't answer that. Yeah. Or in the same way, like how many times I've heard, like even medical people, doctors, use the words interchangeably, cigarette and tobacco, as if they're the same thing. Yeah. Um, and even them, like very educated people, people who work in the medical field, there's a mm. disconnect. They don't realize that's two different things. Um, but that seems to be, you know, that idea of connection to nature, that idea of where does it, where does fish come from? Where does an apple come from? Also this idea of like initiation, beginning to put kids back in touch with the land. Um, is that something you saw that was in a way an, an answer to some of these things that you're, you're speaking about? Well, I think it's coming a lot from we're not going to protect or wants to protect or act to protect something if we don't have a relationship with it. And I'm not talking a one-way relationship. Uh, I know a lot of people that work in industry that are, you know, very damaging to nature, but they still go on holidays, you know, on a beautiful beach and things like that. But they go for their enjoyment, right? They go to take something because they want to relax. They want to distress. So not that kind of relationship with nature, a two-way relationship. I think once you learn that something is alive and you have an experience of it and you see it growing and you take care of it every day, you are going to want to protect it. You are going to care for it, right? It's like the little prince story, right? He cared for his rose and so they, now they are bonded together. Because one gave something to the other and they help each other and at some point they just bonded. And whatever happened, the fate of one is going to influence the fate of the other. So I feel what's missing a lot, and I guess uh, even as a spiritual practice in many ways, it's that experience of relationship with lands. Um, that goes beyond just praying for the land or just going beyond going there to get something out of it like really trying to understand what, what is this relationship, right? How do we get into in deep intimacy? And deep intimacy with a person or an animal or a land comes with a lot of attention, a lot of observation, you know, like, like, okay, where does this come from? How does it grow? What happened? Like it's interest into it, curiosity, right? I want to get to know you, right? Not because I'm going to get something out of you, because I'm interested, I'm curious, I want to get to know you, right? So I need to spend time with you. So it gets with repetition, right? Every day, right? I'm going to sit with there and understand. And then I think we're going to care way more. Because like, you know, I'm also 
I created the New York Bee Sanctuary years ago, so a big non-profit now in the US. And, and you know, many people have heard about the fate of the bees and the pollinator that are disappearing, you know, but people still live their life like it's not happening, right? Because they don't have a direct relationship. This year, you know, I was in my garden this spring and this summer, there's just way less bees. I just know. I don't need to count them. I just, I, I just know how many bees I usually see. I know this year there is less, like way less, you know, and it touched me, right? Because I'm seeing my raspberries or some of the plant there half pollinated, which is very unusual. I've never seen that since I've been here. I was like, oh, the raspberries half developed or not all the flowers, you know, the raspberries is all those little flowers on it. That's like, you need to be pollinated completely to make these beautiful raspberries as we know. And you can see the raspberries are half done or it means there was not enough pollinators to do it. And it break my heart. I felt a lot of sadness a month ago when I was seeing that, you know, and it really, I felt like something is really happening, right? But I have, I have a somatic experience of it because of my 10 raspberry plants, because of the bees, I have, you know, a few bee house that I know that are there. I have a direct relationship with that bee or those birds or that tree. It's very different than well, the Amazon is burning, right? What is it? The size of, uh, I think, uh, the park in New York every day, Central Park burns every day, I think, in size in the Amazon. If Central Park was burning in one day in New York, how many people will react? Like, would do something about it? A lot, right? Yes, it's happening every day in the Amazon, and we are maybe a little bit upset about it. But what do we do about it? Not much, because it's far, right? It's others, the others, right? And we might care about native people, we might care about the forest, but it doesn't touch us deep enough, I think, to call us to action. So I think with the kids and with people that come here, for me, I would say, well, whatever work we do, it's, we want, I want you to be able to connect, right? To, to build that intimacy because then you're going to want to do something about it. And there's millions of ways to do something about it, right? But it's going to call you much more deeply than just sending money to a nonprofit for the Amazon, which is great. You should send money to this nonprofit, right? You should support native people. You should do all that. But get into a relationship with one tribe, one land. If you really care, go there understand it and then start working just with that one little piece of land that lower because then it's going to be your brothers and your sisters there right your uncle your grandparents it's going to be family to you it's not just going to be someone somewhere and i think we're not going to do to save this world i don't know if we can save it anyway it doesn't really matter but we're not going to be really called into authentic action until we have built that intimacy back. And we lost it, right? The, like you say, most kids don't really know. Like people eat tomatoes every day, and I, if I show a tomato flower now, and I don't know how many people will know it's a tomato flower. Right? It's a very unique flower, all the tobacco flower, right? I love them because we have some here in the garden, right? Uh, but yeah, tomato weed every day, right? What does it look like? How does it need to grow? You know, what kind of care it needs. How long does it take between the time you plant it and you get one ripe tomato? 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, what is it? And I think then you're going to care, right? If there's a bee that's coming on that tomato. Like when you're going to see the, the fruit, oh, oh wow, that's how much work it requires from one guy somewhere to grow that fruit. If not, you know, we're staying in our head, right? And we avoid feeling the pain. Uh, it's easier, right, to send a check. It's harder to go there on the front line and do the work. And we need both, right? But I think we need to um, to feel it deeply, which means we have to feel ourselves deeply, right? Do you think there, very similarly, and earlier you mentioned this idea of responsibility, like that freedom also entails responsibility, and 
Do you think that's also part of, as you're saying, like where people's suffering comes from, is it's easier to send the check, which again is great. But in a way there's like an obfuscation of responsibility with that, mm. in that it's much harder to roll up your sleeves and actually like jump into the shit, like jump into the mud. It's a very different experience. Um, it's, it's also very easy to say someone should do something about it. <laughs> the other, right? <laughs> the other. And yes. To, to become very impassioned about that. Yeah, and I think, you know, also we're stealing ourselves from feeling, which is horrible. It might be harder to feel, but at least we're feeling, right? You know, Joanna Macy, when she talks about active hopes, and, and she talks a lot about that, I say, if you're feeling despair for the earth, it's great, because at least you're feeling, right? You're allowing yourself to be strong enough to feel, because to feel, you have to be strong to feel such big things, right? So it might be more difficult at first, right? Like to give the work, to do that. But what you're going to get back to feel connection, which is ultimately what every human being is looking for, to feel connection. You can steal yourself from that by signing a check, by not being involved, by not connecting to people that are suffering, or the forest, all that. No, like four or five years ago, I went to um, Australia and I went to the Tarkine Forest, you know, in Tasmania. And the Tarkine is one of the last uh, temperate rainforest in the world that has been preserved. And it's a magnificent forest. And there is a massive problem because the government is very corrupt in Australia and they're selling the rights to this forest to Chinese company to basically extract the wood, which is being made into a pulp, basically directly on site. You have those massive trees, they just made a pulp with it to make toilet paper. So you have those old growth forests uh, being destroyed there. And you have you know, an organization that is fighting to protect this forest and that. And I heard about all that, right? Before going, I read about the Tarkine and what, what was happening there, but I went with someone that is involved in the blockades there. And, you know, we asked him and said, I want to go see a clear cut site. I want to see people doing that. I want to see what it looks like. It was much easier to stay in the nice part of the forest where the tourist goes that is very well preserved and to camps and to take beautiful photos. And I would have probably have a good, you know, experience. But going to the clear-cut area, which we did one day there, and seeing with my own eyes and feeling and sitting there and crying and singing and praying connected me to that forest like nothing else. I'll never forget that experience. You know, and it pushed me to, in that case, give money because it's very far away. But if I was living there, I would go on the blockade, right? Uh, we did movie projection on to our community to raise funds for that organization, right? And we do regular communication on that issue, right? Because now I feel connected to that forest, you know? Because I've been there, I've experienced something that break my heart and that is still happening. And like, we need to do something about it. You know, I can't save all the forest, but this one, I smell it, right? I saw the birds, I felt the animal, I saw the tree, like, devastated over hundreds of acres, like, like a rough skin, right? Nothing left. And, yeah, then I want to do something about it, you know, because I feel it. Do you think that's part of that kind of overwhelm when people feel that despair is we also, we have access to so much information. Hmm. Whereas in the past, we didn't necessarily. And so yeah. if there was a problem, then most people, they had to roll up their sleeves and do something mm. about it. And it was like that everywhere. But when we see all of the world's problems, it does become kind of despairing. It's like, well, what do I do about all of this? Yeah, I mean, you're right. You're right. I think the bodies are very overwhelmed today, you know, and the pandemic and the lockdowns and all of that added to the, you know, pressures on the bodies, right, to be even more disconnected, right, <laughs> to be alone, uh, 
uh, to be able to see our loved ones and you know I couldn't see my parents in France for like almost two years could not even travel there um, so yes there is pressure from the environment and overwhelming pressure and you add that to the bad food and the bad waters and all of that and our bodies are definitely uh, impacted by it and our nervous system with all the images and all the uh, social media and TVs and radios, you know, is really overwhelmed by information. It's not designed to take that much information in. It was never designed for that. Um, so I think that's where the work you do, the work I do, you know, this work is important to return to that center, right? We need to have tools of self-regulation. We need to know how to return to our some centered, right? which doesn't mean not feeling anything, it means being able to feel all of it, but still being grounded in our mission, right? In connection to wisdom. So we need to do that healing work, but at the same time, because of the urgency and where we are at, we also need to act, right? But if we do the work just to return to peace and to kind of disappear in the forest, I think we misunderstood what this work is about. You know, very often people, and we could uh, work for years, by the way, I'm never going to be healed fully, right? Nobody's going to be. So at some point, we can't wait, right? We need to return imperfect, not fully healed, but start acting because that's going to heal us too. We talked about it earlier, right? My healing is not just happening when I heal myself. It's happening when I heal in community. When I serve, it's immense healing that I'm going to receive. So... It's not, well, I'm too overwhelmed, so I'm just going to focus on my healing or, you know, like one way or another, right? It's like balancing always, right? The trees do that all the time, right? They take the sun, they, you know, grow in their roots, so they self-caring and at the same time, they're producing fruits. They connecting to the mycelium, they're giving nutrients to other trees. They are in really, right? They're balancing it. Hmm? So yeah, we need to have some capacity of that. And many people don't. You know, I think there's a lot of population, native people, you know, BIPOC communities, people that are socially excluded that don't have capacity for that today because they are overwhelmed. They are overworked. They don't have resources. They don't have supports. And so... I think, you know, there's communities for which it's very difficult. But I think if we have more privilege, if we have a little bit more resources, not just money, like internal, emotional resources, intellectual resources, you know, connection resources, whatever it is, then we need to care, right? We need to do something about it and find a way that the work we're doing, this healing work we're doing for ourselves is in service of something that's bigger than ourselves. If not, we're never going to feel healed or whole because we're missing the main components, the essential one, which is connection. It's, it's what we're looking for at the end of the day. It's being completely connected, like a tree in the forest. Yeah. And the tree just focus on his healing, you know, and forget there's tree around. He's never going to get there. And I feel sometimes we are a little bit in this uh, spiritual healing hamster heel wheel, you know, we're just like turning in it and then slow down, but then we go far again, but we are in it, right? So, yeah, we need to do that. I find sometimes, you know, as much and sometimes even more healing by, you know, just taking care of one tree in my garden and then doing a ceremony, you know? And most native communities traditional communities you know their whole life is not centered on their self-healing right it's centered around community health wellness richness right what are these communities growing what do we do they are very connected to the land and yeah they do their ceremony and they work with the plants and that but their life is not separated from that spiritual life right it's just it's one thing and you look at what they do during the day, it's a lot of connection to land, connection to each other, right? Helping each other, taking care of the kids and gathering the plants for the ceremony. And ceremony is a little part of it, their life. But it's not what they do all day long. 
right? But because we're craving that and we lost all of those elements for us, I think we go to the ceremony thinking it's going to give us all of that, but we need to build that. You know, it's not going to come, community is not going to come because you went to ceremony. Connections, it's great to feel connection in ceremonies, right? With all there is or with our brothers and sisters in the circle, but can I feel it when I'm not in ceremony? Can I feel it with my ex, my mother, my father, people I'm angry or people I've been hurt by? That's where the work is, right? And that's the ceremony is giving us the container, enough energy, right? Like we talked about earlier, like having enough resources so I can go out, do the real work. For me, that's the core things of all that dietas and ceremony and things we do. It's so we have more resources to offer the world and we do the work in the real world, right? Not in a little bubble. <laughs> Yeah. And it's hard, right? We have to remind ourselves of it, right? Because the tendency is like, you know, we're going to isolate if it's too scary, overwhelming, you know. It's a tendency that we have to, right? If it's too scary, sometimes I need to isolate anyway. Sometimes I don't have enough for the world, right? That's fine too. But always the balance, right? Uh, always the balance. And is that what brought you, you mentioned going to Peru, is that what brought you to Peru was to learn more about these kind of indigenous worldviews and working with plant medicines? Yeah, I felt very cold by that and, you know, I ended up meeting my teacher, Miguel, who is a Huachumero in, in the Sacred Valley. And, um, yeah, I felt, I mean, I've always been, since I'm little, connected to plants and I've always been a gardener and growing some food, even when I live in an apartment in New York, always needed that connection. And But the prayer component, the ritual, the ceremonial component for me was kind of new because I was raised without any religion or spiritual container already at home. Uh, my parents were very outdoorsy and spent a lot of time in nature, but there was no, I mean, I guess it's one way to connect, right? It's not maybe the traditional spiritual way, but they gave me that amazing connection to nature. But I was looking for some kind of ancient frame to help me kind of direct my prayers, right? Because I didn't really know how to pray. <laughs> Uh, and when I met this tradition, the Indian cosmology tradition, and I heard the prayer as it felt right. It just felt like, oh, this is what I'm going to dive in. So, and yeah, it's one part, right, of what we do, the prayer, right? But it frames a lot, I think, how we see life too. For me, it's not just a ceremony or a prayer thing. It's, it's a whole way to look at life through eyes of elders, generation of elders that looked at the world over and over and over again and then came with those prayers, with those rituals in response to what was happening. And so I think they contain uh, a translation of the original instructions of God. That's how I feel it, right? The, the trees is still carry the original instructions, right? Even my cat probably. <laughs> But for us, we as human beings, I feel we need to have this original instruction kind of translated in something that our mind can understand, that our heart can feel, and then we can act from there. So for me, the studying of that tradition, which I still do, you know, is going to last until I die, it helps me frame uh, those instruction into something practical you know, and, 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 and beautiful and, uh, yeah, yeah, and something that can really uh, help me see. Um, that makes sense to me, right? For some people that tradition might not resonate, but uh, for me, it's, uh, there's not a day that passed where I don't see that the way this elder thing thing is an answer to something that's happening in the world today, right? If I use that frame to look at it, then I'm going to avoid feeling the pitfall of my, maybe my culture or the systems that I'm living in. I might see a different lens and act maybe differently because of that. It's been proven very useful, especially in the past few years. <laughs> mm. yeah. 
can you talk a bit about uh, the, the sanctuary, the, the, the center you created, and the work that's done here, the work you do, and, and yeah, just anything, uh, the idea behind that, and, sure. and what's, what's happening here? Yeah. Um, well, the, the name already, I was just talk about the name. The name, the idea is that sometimes we need the sanctuary inside of us when the world is too much, like we were talking about earlier. Or we need a place where we can go and we can um, recharge, remember, restore. And so that was that the name of sanctuary is uh, the idea and the vibration of the world. I believe in the vibration of words is that we create an umbrella, kind of a container where people in need of healing um, can find a place that gives them that. And for me, that works a lot to uh, the land caretaking that we do every day like we you know we rebuilt an edible forest and we planted over i think 600 or 700 plants or trees now that are native we've removed the invasive species so we try to recreate something that i think i feel or maybe you feel on the land that there's a vibration there's harmony that people will heal from that just by being there right doesn't need me Really, so that was kind of the idea to create a place that feels very much like that when we enter it. Um, and then to bring, um, you know, ceremony, rituals, gatherings, um, teachings, elders, teachers like you guys, you know, bringing people that can nurture that prayer. Oh, we are looking at it. So we do, you know, things from permaculture and land cultivation and all the way to, yeah, working with older traditions and prayers and ceremonies and honoring uh, this world, honoring the fire, honoring the waters, honoring the moon. And, you know, we have a woman's garden. We have a lot of things that have been built over the years in response to what we heard from that prayer. Let's say hey, we should maybe build that. So I didn't have a clear ID when I kind of built it, opened it. I still don't, by the way. It's always, for me, it's like a river. It's an evolving prayer. So I try not to constrain it and just feel into where it's going and to spend a lot of time deep listening to the land. Nothing that happened here happened without the land asking me for it. I try to get out of the way because I have a lot of IDs, but I don't know if it's what the land wants. Or with the spirits that live on this land once. So I set a good year with each new ID and you know, write about it and pray and really feel until it's very clear that it's really what should be happening, right? We want to walk in relationship. When we're teaching that, so we need to walk that talk. So for me, the land here, we're a guest on it, right? So I need to listen to what she wants, how she wants it. And sometimes she feels like um, a very jealous wife and uh, very like, no, this is like that, this is like this. Sometimes she's very like uh, an old grandmother, very loving. It's like, okay, everything, I'm here, you know. And sometimes she is uh, in need of healing and she wants to be the patient, and then we are the patients. She said, well, now I need to be the patients a little bit, so I need more caretaking. So that's what I mean by intimacy, right? It's, you know, and I always feel it, even when I travel, I always feel her. So I always know, kind of, you know. But that didn't happen overnight, right? It's been 15 years of daily, daily work, right? And it's still building, right? I'm still a child here, and she's the elder. So I need to keep listening and feeling and, you know, and trusting that, right? There's a lot of trust also. Slowing down a lot. I think, you know, that's also what we want here at the sanctuary. The world is going so fast. I think people are exhausted often because of that, just because we're not designed to go that fast. <laughs> and so slowing down and... I think once you slow down and sit on the land, you know, things get, get taken care of by the land. That's what I believe, right? You start feeling your grief, your rage, your confusion, your pain. 
and I don't believe there's much more to do than just feeling it very often, right? And praying and humbling ourselves and trusting. And people just say, oh, I feel much better now that I cried, right? Or well, that I slept over here for a few nights. You know? It's bigger than us yeah, when we do those things. So for me, the sanctuary, you know, obviously it's kind of uh, my prayer in some ways, but I don't feel it's my prayer. I feel it's a prayer that came from the land and it was named differently, by the way, and the deers came to me in a ceremony and asked me to change the name. So uh, the name came also from the animals. It was not my name. Uh, you know, so we, that's what I mean. Like it's, it looks like it's my place, but for me, it's, uh, yeah, I'm trying to, in that form as a human, what can I do to help those who are in different forms that maybe can do what I do and helping them prosper, connect, you know, feel more in relations. And so um, it's beautiful. I mean, if you ask me, I don't think there's anything more beautiful than what I'm doing, but. Uh, <laughs> And is there any like personal work or any regular things here that you'd like to talk about, like events that people can come if they want to participate? Sure, in? yeah. I mean, we do breath work, uh, walking with the breath, um, shamanic breath work, which is very powerful. We do that once a week online. Uh, we have a shamanic school where we teach breath work also for people to become practitioners of breath work. So we you know, run the school. We have a new cycle starting in September. Uh, which is shamanic reiki and also we have a, a, a shamanic school in terms of learning a little bit those ways right it, it's always tricky because you know you can't teach anyone any of that really it's self-revealed but it's kind of bringing tools so you can have your own practice uh, reconnect to your ancestors reconnect you know to your own medicine and then from there see if this is your calling right see how much of that is going to unfold in your life uh, so we have a lot of programs like that sometimes we have elders that comes to speak we have you know an elder coming next week uh sweat lodge and vision quest um yeah anything that basically align with that prayer right bringing you guys bringing tree dietas and you know tobacco dieta here which i think you know is uh something that was, I think we talked about it last year, right? My, my prayer for a long time to start dieting local trees, uh, like the oak trees and the maple trees and, you know, the tulip poplar trees. So I felt, you know, those have been lost there for, I don't know, long, right? But people used to do it. I mean, it's completely disappeared from continental northern U.S. pretty much, aside from maybe some reservation a little bit. Um, but I feel it's, you know, one way to build that intimacy, right? So bringing that kind of teachings and ceremonies for me is really important. So we, we keep building that, right? We keep inviting people into reconnecting. Yeah, and then we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one work, you know, people that comes for specific elements. You know, I work mainly with trauma. That's pretty much all my clients. People come with physical abuse or emotional trauma or some kind of other type of trauma, but that's the core of my work to work with people which, uh, yeah, have some level of trauma. Great, Angel. And if um, people want to reach out to you or the sanctuary, the website is the best way? Yeah, or? the best way is to go on the website, uh, thesanctuaryheal.com. I mean, I guess you'll mention it, but thesanctuaryheal.com. Um, they can also search me on Instagram and find me there. Yeah. Well, great, Angel. Thank you for your time. And, Thank you uh, so much, brother. As I already mentioned to you, it was you know coming to this land was was very revelational for me as well because I I was also wondering where my work was moving towards. I, I spent a long time working mm -hmm. in an ayahuasca center and facilitating that, and then beginning to do this work with tobacco and tree dietas and. I was always very hesitant to leave the jungle because it, it was a technology that, that I would learned there and all the trees I worked with were from there. And um, So for various reasons I was hesitant to bring it outside of that, that, mm. that area. 
But then coming here, much like you said, uh, just looking around at all of these trees, which in a way, I don't want to say were, are my trees, but they're, they're the trees I grew up with. They're mm -hmm. the trees that I'm familiar with. I, as you said, like in Corsica, like I know the smells. I, mm -hmm. I've seen them grow. I, I know their woods. I, I know the medicine of, of many of them. And I remember sitting here in, uh, one night and just seeing all of these trees. Uh, you know, I probably smoked quite a bit. <laughs> uh, but just feeling all of this light that was being unused. It was like mm. it, they were just sitting there waiting to be used to share their medicine. Mm. And I think it's, it's something that, that, that sometimes I think we forget is, is all of this medicine if it's not being used, then it's not fulfilling its purpose. Mm -hmm. there, there's a reason these trees have medicine and, and they want to share. Yeah. And there's this whole ecosystem, all of these trees, all these medicines just waiting to share their light. And as you said, uh, people have forgotten to use them. And so it was very much uh, really made me rediscover and, and what I think feels much more in alignment now is actually bringing this technology from the jungle, this process, this teaching, this cosmovision, but beginning to work with more North American plants, European plants, uh, mm. really in this role of like bridging these traditions. Mm. And, and I think that's a role a lot of us are, I think, finding ourselves stepping into is this role of like bridge keeping, like mm. taking all of this knowledge and creating a new earth, which which is a very ancient legend that's mm. that has been passed down, but we've we've forgotten it. That we're in the time of of bridging all of these medicines to create a, a new world, the world mm. that I think we're all looking for. So, uh, yeah, just to thank you to you also for for bringing us here, um, because that's really that's really been a huge gift now, and and I think that's the direction probably my and, and potentially Marav and I work will we'll head in is mm -hmm. really beginning to work with more of these trees through this technology, through this process of dieting, but working with, as you said, oaks and poplar and sassafras and birch and yew and hawthorn and elder. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's just there's so many so amazing many trees, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and they have so much uh, knowledge. And, you know, recently we began working a lot with oak and in Israel, we were working with olive and, uh, I have some hawthorn bark that I got in Ireland, which is a very mm. special tree for me. So when I go back to Peru, that that's a hawthorn tree. Is I want powerful. To yeah. yeah, and really slowly, just beginning to 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 work with these these medicines and begin to 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 learn from them, so that we can also begin to give. And because also, as you were saying, that there, there's these Amazonian trees are amazing. They're they're amazing, um, and and. Uh, I think it's it's important to always share them in a way so that also, as you said, there is that connection to the roots, to the lineage, to that forest. Mm -hmm. um, and also it's a much different connection when, when you have a tree that you can go to every day and give a prayer to, touch it, see it, smell it, use its medicine because you have a connection with it now, not only for yourself, but begin to share that. And as you said, really begin to appreciate that tree to, to really care for it, to propagate mm. it, to, to grow it yourself, to to care for the land, because you have a deep connection with that tree. It's part of you now. It, there, it's a much different resonance, and um, and I do. I think that's a that's a big part of how we begin to to heal the world in a way, yeah. beginning by healing ourselves. I mean, there are you know multi-dimensional beings like we are those trees. I think in the Amazon that has not been forgotten, you know, they are used in multi-dimensions, right, physical for objects, but also medicinal for their essence and what you can get, and also spiritual, right, the spirit of the tree. But here I feel in the Western world, you know, we, the trees, you know, are already calling for it because they, they are monodimensional, they are objects, right, we call them to make furnitures and papers and all of that a little bit used for medicine, you know, and almost very rarely, you know, for spiritual connection. So they lost that. But if you think of it, that's exactly what happened to us here. We are multidimensional beings, but we are put in a system that made us one dimension, monodimensional. We are objects to serve and to work 
and to create value for the system. But we've forgotten that we are medicine and we've forgotten that we're also spirit, right? So I really feel that it's interesting to see that what we're trying to you know, do there is also what we're trying to do for ourselves. It's just a mirror here, what's happening with the forest here and that kind of type of work. For me, it's like such a beautiful reflection of what we're trying to awaken into people. And yeah, it goes also back to the discussion on relationship, right? Then if I see it as a multidimensional being, I'm probably going to treat it differently than if it's just a piece of furniture, right? Or to make toilet paper. Yeah. Well, great, Angel. I think the, the ladies are waiting outside to, to come in. But um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, brother. For sharing. Yeah, thank and, you so much. And uh, I think there's a lot more we can talk about, but maybe next year we'll do, uh, we'll do part two. Part two. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, brother. Thank you, my friend. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's it. I hope you enjoyed that show with Angel. It was really a pleasure for me to sit down and catch up with him. Um, as always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Patreon is a really good option. It's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can sign up. There's different tiers you can sign up for. Those things give you uh, things back like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. To all of the people who have done that, thank you very much. As always, I deeply appreciate your support. And if you're able to do that, thank you very much in advance. Uh, if you're not able to and you're listening on the YouTube version, uh, just hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, that's a really big help and with the audio version uh, following the show and leaving a starred rating and a short review is a really big help um, this is the end of my travels so I'm not sure the following guests who are coming up but as always I hope to try and bring on some really fascinating people so thank you all very much for tuning in I hope you're all doing great and I will see you all on the next episode Thank mm-hmm. you.